Good morning. Uh, we're about to start the webinar. Uh, first, I want to do a check. If you can hear me, then please click on the raise hand button so that I know that you can hear me. Okay, great, I see a number of hands up, so apparently it's working. Um, today I'm gonna have the participants, that means you, muted, so that I can conduct the, the webinar. And if you have questions, just jot them down, and then after the webinar, send me an email. Uh, my email address is pat at studies.com. You can see it on this opening slide and uh, I'll get back and answer your questions. So let's begin. I'm gonna be talking about uh, several different topics. First of all, using standard error to constrain the search space for your optimization. I'm gonna talk about using uh, capability uh, as a measure for optimizing your DOA. This is a way you can work specifications into the optimization um, quite directly. I'm gonna show a trick. It's a pretty easy one, but if you don't think of it, uh, you could be missing out on uh, how to reduce the size of a design that has categoric factors. And then I have two different case studies that show how to, um, diagnostics can be used to uh, salvage something that at the, uh, the initial analysis doesn't look very promising, but using diagnostics you can clean it up and, and get something out of it. So let's just start right in with using uh, standard error as a uh, means to optimize your process. And what we're gonna see is for this particular example, I'm gonna do a, a four factor uh, central composite design that if we'd normally search the uh, box for the factorial, the plus and minus one factorial part, um, you can expand that search area so you have five times the volume with no loss in precision. So it's a, it's a pretty useful technique. So here's a central composite design. The example I'm gonna using show the example I'm using uses four factors, but um, I've used a picture with three because that's all I can draw. And so you can see the central composite design is, is composed of a, a factorial, a two-level factorial. Those are the blue points. Uh, some center points, so that red point in the middle is a center point, and it's replicated. And then some axial points. The axial points extend on the coordinate axes, so that goes through the center point encoded units. Uh, outside of the, the cube, the, the axial distance I'm using gives a rotatable design. So for the four factor central composite design, the axial points are occurring at plus and minus two, the factorial points at plus and minus one, and the center point of course is at zero. Now, once you've fit a model to your data and you use that model to make prediction, you can also use that model to see what the error associated with that prediction is. And so this is the equation that you use to do that. So the, the variance of the predicted value at, at a particular point, so the small x sub zero is a particular set of coordinates in the uh, factor space. So that's just a point somewhere inside your design space. So the, uh, you, you go to that point, you can make a prediction, then the variance associated with that average prediction. So you can see that this is talking about the variance of y bar, or the average of y. It's got a hat on it, so that means it's predicted at that particular set of coordinates is going to be equal to that location transpose times x transpose x. And you don't need to know this, 
but what I'm trying to show is the, the, the variance associated with the prediction is a function of where you are in the design space, so that's the little x. The design that you ran, that's the, the big x, and the model that you used, well, that, that big X is expanded out for the model that you use. So if we used a quadratic model, you know, we'd add columns for the AB interaction, for the A squared term, and so on. But it's basically a function of the design you use, the model you fit, where you are in your design space, then times that standard deviation squared. So after you fit your analysis of variance, there's that, that, that residual mean square error, and the square root of that is given as the standard deviation at the bottom of the ANOVA. That's that S, so it's a function of the, the unexplained error of the model, where you are in the design space, the design you used, and the model you fit. Okay, in this four-factor central composite design, if we typically think of doing our optimization within the factorial cubes, that would be between the plus and minus ones. Well, the largest standard error in that cube occurs at the, the corner, and it's 3.44, rounding, rounding it off a bit. Okay, turns out that the axial points have that same standard error, 3.44. Okay, so if we took a slice through the cube, right at the center, so I'm looking at two of the factors, A and B, and I'm setting the other factors, C and D, to zero. So I'm slicing right through the center of the cube. So on that slice, you can see the four axial points for A and B, and the replicated center point. The center points run six times. And if we look at the, a contour for a standard error of 3.44, it goes through those axial points, okay, because that's the standard error there. So you could see that if we only searched the cube, we'd be missing out on a lot of area extending out to the axial points. Now, if we move up to the top of the cube, so now this is a slice where C is at plus 1, D is at plus 1. So we're slicing through the top of the cube. Now we draw the same contour for 3.44. It goes through the corners of the cube. Okay, because that was, the, remember that we picked the air, the largest area inside that cube occurred at the corner. We're using that to bound our design space. Now, of course, this would have like a little dome that expends, extends above the top of the cube going out to the axial point uh, that's above that slice. Okay, so basically we have, uh, we could search the cube itself or we could search the sphere that, that, that the cube's inscribed in. So that's touching all the corners of the cube. Okay, now to do that, what we do is, well, first you'd have to go to options and turn on standard error then standard error gets added to your criteria for making uh, optimization. And we'd say, well, what we want to do in this case, they were measuring uh, one response was protein, and their goal was to find the factor settings that maximize the protein. So we say we want to maximize that. And then we put in standard error. Well, we don't want to search beyond the place where standard error is 3.44. So we just say standard error is going to be in range. There's no lower limit, so we delete that. And for an upper limit, we put in the 3.44, or not rounding it off, the, the exact value at that corner point. Okay, now when we do the search, it's climbing up toward the top of the hill, and it stops when the standard error is equal to 3.44. Okay, so we get uh, factor settings, and you can see the, the heating is well beyond what it would have been if we'd stopped when we hit the, the minus 1 value for heat, which would be constraining it to the cube. Okay, and our, our predicted protein, average protein at that point is, is uh, 86.3 with a standard error of 3.44. 
Okay, so comparing uh, three different options, if we searched only the cube, we'd find an optimum of, of uh, 84.7. Uh, that's too restrictive because now we're stopping when we hit the edge of the cube. Okay, the standard error is only 2.6. And if we're saying we're, we would allow uh, a maximum standard error within that space would be in the corner of the cube, and that's 3.44. We said, okay, well, the, the standard error at the axial point is 3.44. Let's do a cube with a, a plus and minus 2. Well, that's too liberal. The largest standard error in that cube is 13.4. Four. Okay, so quite a bit higher than, than what we might be willing to accept. And if we did the optimization, we get a prediction of, of 89, but that 89 has a standard error of, of 10.3. Again, bigger than we might be willing to accept. Now, if we use the standard error to constrain the space, which is what we, what we just did on this side, and we said, okay, we're going to uh, really search uh, the area, and I put in the area as plus and minus two coded units, so I changed each of the factors to plus or minus two, but I said don't go beyond 3.44 standard error. Then what it finds is that that optimum we just looked at of 86, and it stopped when it hit the standard error of 3.44. And as I said, this this gives us 400% uh, more or five times the area uh, that you'd have just using the plus and minus one cube, but doesn't get into any higher standard errors associated with the predicted values than could be uh, occur searching the plus and minus one cube. Okay, so that's, that's uh, a big advantage. Uh, another big advantage is if we don't have a nice rotatable design, um, let's say we're analyzing some historic data. So this is three factors, A, B, and C. These are the points we have. You can see they're not going to give us a really nice design. Um, they're not, it's not a central composite design or even a nicely balanced design. There's empty spaces. There's spaces where we have lots of data. Uh, it's what we have. Okay, we can go ahead and fit this with a model, and the nice thing is, is when we um, pick a standard error, and you should pick a standard error based on how precisely you need to know the response. In this case, I just said, well, I'm going to use the standard error at the, that's the highest standard error achieved at a design point. So I just enumerated the points, said here's the highest one. I don't want to be any bigger than that. Then I plotted A and B and took slices of C, and you can see for a slice of C for minus 1, we get a, a, a relatively uh, large search area that's egg-shaped. Uh, with C0, we get a larger area. Okay, it's irregularly shaped, and you can see it's kind of shaped the way the data occurred. And then at C plus 1, we get a really small area uh, moved way over to one side, of, of A and kind of kind of centered on B because that's where we had data. So using the standard error will adjust the area you're, you're searching to where you have good information. Okay, so here's using the, the standard error with that, trying again to maximize the response, stopping when we hit a standard error that's equal to the highest standard error of a design point and then do the optimization, and it turns out it, uh, it occurs at a, a, a setting of 1 for C, so that means we're on this slice over on the right, that's plus 1, and then optimized within there, then stopped when it hit that boundary of standard error of uh, the maximum that we're willing to accept. So it defines a, a search area that matches the design properties. So our first example was we had a rotatable CCD. So we, we basically had a, a, a sphere that inscribed our, our two-level factorial cube. If we'd had a face-centered CCD, well, then we'd end up with a more cuboidal design. We'd have kind of concentric cubes instead of concentric spheres defining our error. Um, for 
historical data or optimal designs, you're going to get irregular shapes. Now, even for a rotatable design uh, where you have all of the data um, and everything's nicely symmetric, if you have some missing data, um, that's no longer going to be a perfect sphere. Uh, or if you have all the data but you end up reducing the model, again, it's not going to be a perfect, perfect sphere. So the nice thing about using the standard error, it adjusts for what data you have and also adjusts for what model you have. So if you end up doing model reduction, that's going to actually uh, extend the uh, area even further because you're estimating a smaller model with the same amount of air, the same amount of uh, data, uh, so you get better precision in some directions. And so it'll adjust for that automatically. Okay, so um, that's my, my uh, first example. And I just want to run a check to see if you're still with me. So if you're still with me, if you'd click your raise hand button, then I'll know that uh, the broadcast is still working. Okay, I see a, a, a number of hands going up, so I'm just going to continue. So the, the next thing I'm going to talk about is employing a uh, capability statistic to optimize your DOE. And this is just a, another tool that you should have in your toolkit. And it's a nice tool because it's an easy way to incorporate specifications into your optimization. So uh, well, if you're not real familiar with process capability, here's a little refresher. And uh, if you're unfamiliar with it, you might have to do a little digging after the, the webinar to, to get familiar with it. But basically what we want to do is we want to see how close is our process center. So you can see here's a normal distribution. We've got plus and minus three sigma. That includes, you know, 99.7% of the, the normal distribution. Um, and then we want to see how close we are to the closest specification. So we're going to look at the minimum of the, the center of, the design, of our data, the mu, to each of the specifications. Take that minimum and divide it by, by three sigma. So it measures how many units of three sigma are we away from the specifications? So if I, I took this illustration on the slide and just slid it over till uh, that, that plus three sigma was right on the specification, we'd have a capability index of, of one, okay? If I had this so that the closest the closest specification was four and a half standard deviations away, that would basically be what we call a six sigma process. Remember, they get a one and a half standard deviation, a wiggle room in the middle with six sigma. One and a half from six gives us four and a half. So a CPK of, of uh, four and a half standard deviations. So that would be four and a half standard deviations divided by three would be a CPK of one and a half. So one and a half would be basically basically six sigma. So that's what we'd be, be striving for. If the, the CPK is less than one, then we're in big trouble. We're going to have a lot of product out of spec. Okay, there's a, another measure called PPK. And if you look at it, it's, it's the same formula, but it has a different S in it. So it's exactly like a PPK. A PPK is exactly like a CPK. The only difference is, is the, the PPK uses the estimate of standard deviation is long term. Okay, when we're running a DOE, generally what we're doing is we're capturing the short term variation because the DOE is run over a relatively short period of time compared to what the process would be run at if it was in production. Also, we're generally pretty careful about controlling everything when we're doing a, a designed experiment. So when we go to set temperature, we're very careful to try and get the set point exactly on the targeted value. Okay, so that means that, that typically that, that standard deviation, remember we talked about the standard deviation in um, the predicted values as being the uh, square root of the residual mean square error, and that's that S at the bottom of your ANOVA. 
that S generally I think of that as capturing the short-term variation. So if we use that, we're going to get a, an estimate of CPK. And that's, I always think of as, well, that's, that's the best we can do. But it's not necessarily realistic. And so if you want a more realistic, you'd use a PPK. Well, how can we get a PPK from that same data? Well, what we could do is we could think about using propagation of error. And so what you need to remember is when we talk about I'm going to vary temperature, I'm going to vary pressure, I'm going to vary time, we aren't actually varying temperature. We're varying the set point of temperature. And so every time I move between the high and the low temperature I'm trying to achieve, I move it to that set point, I'm going to get something a little bit, probably a little bit off of what I'm trying to achieve. It's not going to be perfect. And so I'm going to get a distribution of temperatures around my two set points. Okay. Now that variation in temperature, if there is a relationship between the factor, in this case temperature, and the response we're measuring, that variation in temperature is going to translate to variation in the response. Now if it's a linear relationship, it doesn't matter if I'm varying around a lower temperature or a higher temperature, it's going to affect the level of the response, but not the variation in the response. If I have a curvilinear relationship, then the variation in temperature where the curve is steeper is going to translate into more variation than that same amount of variation where the curve is flatter. So basically what, what POE does, propagated error, so we're talking about the error propagated from the variation of our factors around their set points into variation in the response. Normally when we're doing the DOE, we're controlling these factors really close. But think about when you move to production, it's probably done on a larger scale, it's probably more difficult to achieve the temperature exactly. Uh, you're doing it day after day after day, you may not be, in, be paying quite as much attention. There's probably going to be more variation with that, that factor in, in real use than occurred during the designed experiment. So in theory, what we could do is we could use this propagated error and we could look at, okay, I'm, I'm running a DOE and I want to achieve a certain targeted value, but I also want to achieve that targeted value with the least amount of variation. So I might be able to go in and use the factors that have a lot of curvature and search for where they're flatter and use them to reduce the variation and then look at the factors that are more linear and use those to draw it back on the target. Okay, so curvature factors, look for the flats. Linear factors, use them to draw it back on the target. Okay, once you've fit a model to your data, the POE comes almost for free. It's not free because what you have to provide is What's the standard deviation? So if I go back to here, what's the standard deviation of the factor around its set point? Well, how do you get that? Well, sometimes you can get that from the equipment manufacturer who will tell you, you know, this controller has this much variation. Sometimes you get that by doing some type of a uh, a gauge R&R &R study on that particular controller and find out how much variation actually exists. But that's the, these sigmas. So the sigma II, so that's going to be the sigma associated with factor A, the sigma associated with factor B, and so on. Okay, this delta F, that's just the function we fit. So that's whatever polynomial we fit to our data. And then the delta, delta x's are just the change in the x variables. So basically, once you have um, your model, then you have your variance that's associated with the predictions. And you get this extra variance that comes from the variation in the factors. And then the very last part, the sigma sub e, that's the variation that your model doesn't explain. So again, that's the standard deviation off of that ANOVA table, just the square root of the root mean square error. Okay, so that's, that's, uh, that 
is what we'd have if we didn't input the sigmas for the factors. And that would give us our, our CPK. But if we can get realistic estimates of what the, the variation of the factors are going to be in actual use, then we can add that variation in and get an estimate of what the PPK would be, what more realistic estimate of what we're going to have for capability. Okay, so remember CPK is using short-term variation, PPK is using long-term. If we don't use propagated air, we're always getting CPK. If we can use the propagated air, we can approximate the PPK. Okay, so the, the residual mean square error gives us an estimate of short-term variation. Propagation of error allows us to estimate what the longer-term variation is, is going to be and get a more PPK-like estimate of sigma. So let's just look at an example I took out of one of our workshops, and they're looking here at, at machining a part, and they're looking at the speed, the feed, the depth, the cut, they're varying that using a box banking design. Their Q response is delta, the deviation of the finished part's dimension from its nominal value. So delta is measured in mils or thousandths of an inch. And the ideal would be a delta of zero. We've got exactly what we wanted. Delta minus means we took too much off. A delta plus means we didn't take enough off. Okay, so we go through and, and run the box banking design. You can see this is fit with a reduced quadratic model. That model's significant. All the terms in the model are significant. The lack of fit's insignificant. We've got uh, adjusted and predicted our squared are in good agreement. We've got adequate precision. And you can see this standard deviation which is the square root of this mean square of the residual. And that's our estimate of variation that we'd use to calculate CPK. That's our short-term variation, the variation we, we saw when we were running the DOE that can't be explained by our model. Okay, then what we can do is once we've got the model, we can go back and put in the, the sigma associated with each of our factors. So we said, okay, when we set speed, the standard deviation associated with speed is 5. The feed, the standard deviation is 0.00175. Um, depth of cut, it's 0.0125. Okay, our specifications are we want to have a delta zero. That's what that would be ideal, but we can we can have plus or minus 0.4. Okay, so now we're going to use our, our um, capability statistics to, to estimate, to, to try and optimize this process. And our goal is to maximize PPK. Well, there is no goal for PPK. You just put in a goal for CPK. Our specs are minus 0.4 to plus 0.4. CPK, ideally, we'd have zero. Um, I mean, not ideally. The lowest you can have, sorry, the lowest you can have is zero. And ideally, we'd have something uh, uh, approaching six sigma or, or 1.5. Okay, we then go in and do the optimization. And you can see that the optimization then gives you, for, for uh, these factor levels, that's where the optimum is, gives you uh, two answers, the delta for not using POE. So that would be the, the, the delta for the CPK. And that, that, when you calculate out where you ended up relative to the specs, gives you a CPK of 1.66. But then when we say, well, when we add in that, that added variation due to the variation in the inputs, we get a, a slightly different answer. And you can see the standard deviation associated with that answer is bigger because now we're accounting for the variation in the inputs. And that gives us a, a CPK, which now is we're trying to uh, estimate the long-term variation, so it's more like a PPK, of 1.11. 1 
Okay, so we could say, well, the best we could ever expect is, you know, 1.66. Realistically, it's not nearly that good. It's not six sigma. Uh, it, we're just barely over one sigma. And so that gives us a more realistic estimate of what's going on. Okay, so now what you could, what you could do uh, in this case is, is go back and ask what if questions. Well, first of all, the first what if question is if I could control all the factors without variation, I could move from a 1.11 to 1.66. Okay, that's probably not possible, but you could go back and say, well, which one's causing the biggest problem? So set the standard deviation for factor A to zero, Reoptimize, see what you get for for the POE or the PPK like. Then put it back at five. Set B to zero, see what you get. Put that back to its value. Set C to zero, and you could see how much each one's contributing to the uh, inflation in the the variation. And then you can say, well, what if I could spend some more money and get a better controller for whichever one's the biggest problem and reduce its standard deviation in half and go back and see what that does. So you can do different iterations to see which of the factors causing the biggest infl inflation in the air or reducing the, CP the PPK the most and then see if you can work on that to, to reduce the variation associated with it. Now the nice thing about using um, CPK is for to keep this short, I only used one response, but when you have multiple responses, you know it's taking into account all of the responses uh, and all of their specifications by trying to maximize the overall desirability and that desirability is a function of what each of the CPKs or PPKs are. Okay, so uh, it brings the specifications into the optimization. We can use POE to get a better representation of what the long-term variation is. In multiple response optimization, the various process capabilities can be weighted. So if you have responses that are more important than other responses, you can give them a higher weight or importance in the uh, optimization. Uh, we can explore these what if questions. What if there was better control of the factors? And try setting each of the factors to zero one at a time, see where our biggest problem is and then what we can do about it. Okay, so that's a little bit on, on actually two topics, use, using uh, CPK and then also using propagated error to approximate PPK. Okay, so um, that wraps up that topic. So again, I'll just do a little check, and if if you can, if you're still with me, not only hearing me but but still listening, raise your hand. Okay, I see a a number of hands going up. So at least at least some people are still with me. So I'll just continue along here, and we'll look at. Um, combining categoric factors to reduce redundancy and reduce the number of runs. So uh, this is a problem I worked on where they were trying to prove, um, improve the, uh, prove the effectiveness of a road detectant system for chemical warfare agents. So basically what they wanted to do was use spectroscopy to uh, determine the composition of a cloud of gas that's uh, in the distance to find out if there's something in there that could be um, potentially dangerous. Okay, so the the factors they were looking at were, were the uh, chemical warfare agent for threshold and, and objective, so two different levels of a chem chemical warfare agent, uh, in interferent, so none. Uh, what if there was was a, a cloud of a chemical warfare agent and there's also burning diesel or burning plastic? That's going to make it more difficult to detect. Uh, whether it's day or night, uh, how far away it is, uh, the environment, and these, these last four that define the environment are, are what really makes 
uh, are the ones we're really going to work on to make the design a little bit more practical. But they're interested in a desert environment, a tropical environment, an Arctic environment, an urban environment, and a forest environment. What season, whether it was summer or winter, temperature high or low, and humidity high or low. Okay, looking at the last four factors, there's, there's too many combinations, and not all of these combinations are meaningful. So uh, if you look at this, there's one, two, three, four, five. So you've got five times two is 10, times two is 20, times two is 40 combinations. We've got 40 combinations of these environmental factors. And if you enumerate those combinations, they're not all meaningful. Tropical environment with low temperatures and low humidity, it's not going to happen. An Arctic environment with high temperatures and high humidity, that's not going to happen. So we've got combinations that we'd have to go through and, and, and eliminate from our final design. And that's going to cause problems then with factors, with these factors as they're defined, having missing data, potentially being aliased, or certainly their interactions aliased. It's going to make analysis of the design very problematic. So the solution we came up with is to combine these four categoric factors into one. So basically go through and enumerate the 40 combinations and say, okay, out of these 40 combinations, which ones are you really interested in testing? And it turned out that the, a winter desert with low temperature and low humidity and a summer desert with high temperature, low humidity uh, a tropic with high and high, the Arctic with low and low, urban winter and urban summer. Urban winter has low temperature, low humidity. Urban summer has high temperature, high humidity. And then the same thing for forest, a forest winter and a forest summer. Okay, so out of those 40 combinations, we've reduced it down to the ones that are most meaningful and that really reduces the size of our design. We reduced the size of our design by 80% uh, from going from 1,440 runs to 288 runs uh, for the chemical warfare agent we were testing. And what's nice is now all of these combinations can be run and they all result in meaningful results. We can fit the full model um, by preventing meaningless or impossible runs that result in missing data and thereby create an alias model, by only doing the ones that make sense, we avoid that problem. Okay, so that's just, just something to think about when you have categoric factors. And there's lots of times that I have worked with people and they have categoric factors and they say, well, these are the categoric factors, these are the levels. But there's certain combinations I can't run, so they try to build the design and then they delete the runs that they can't run and then they go look at the design and the models they're trying to fit are aliased or poorly estimated and this is a way to get around that problem. Okay, we're coming into the, into the home stretch, so uh, I'll just ask, this will be the last time I'll ask you to, to, to raise your hand, but if you raise your hand just so I have some feedback that, that everything's still operating correctly, and I'm seeing a lot of hands going up, so thank you. Um, and now I'm going to just go through a couple case studies to show how using diagnostics can um, turn a problem that looks like we didn't learn anything into a problem where we learned something. Um, but diagnostics, to do that by themselves is impossible. You also have to have subject matter knowledge. So let's take a look at that. So this came from a, an article that was in Quality Engineering uh, a number of years ago where they were using a computer-controlled lathe to machine um, bar stock. Uh, is it cuts, machines the surface and releases it. Uh, the cullet holds the part in place while it's being machined. The operator programs the, the speed, the rate of spin, um, the depth of cut, and they hand tighten the cullet. 
Okay, the response is the surface finish measured on the same one inch. They have these parts. They, they designated one inch on the part and measured that same one inch on all the parts and took surface readings. And the higher the reading, the, the rougher the surface. Lower readings implies a smoother surface, and that's what we're trying to achieve. Okay, so the, the factors they had were the speed, the feed, the cullet, whether it was loose or tight, and then they also used a new tool and a tool that had been used to uh, machine 250 parts. And so the design they used was a two-level factorial, and they replicated it. And then they analyze that to see what was causing the rough surface. Okay, here's the, the, the data from that design. You can see uh, we, we've got the, uh, a lot of things that were selected, uh, A, B, C, and all of their interactions, including the three-factor interaction, was important. And then anything involving D ended up interspersed with the green triangles. And remember, the green triangles are uh, the estimate of error from the the, the replicate design. Okay, now that seemed a little odd that we'd get a full factorial model including the three-factor interaction for those three factors. Uh, the model was significant. Um, the uh, lack of fit was was insignificant. Uh, the adjusted and predicted R squared were in a reasonable agreement and we got adequate precision. But when we looked at the diagnostics, they didn't look so good. So there's three of the runs here that are highlighted. Uh, and that's the one run on the left and the two on the right on the normal probability plot of the externally studentized residuals. And uh, the point, the two points that are outside the red limit are highlighted. And one point that's that's uh, uh, you know between the uh, 100 and 200 predicted value on the upper side is the third point, and then you can see the three points that fall outside. Uh, that that two of them fall outside, and one of them is getting close to the red limits on the externally studentized residual versus the the uh, uh, run number or time. Okay, now, so we went back and looked at what those parts were, and all three of those parts were a low speed and a loose cullet. And they went back and looked at these parts, and they noticed that, uh, that uh, when they looked at these, they had an unusual finish. It wasn't just a rough finish. The, the actual profile within the one-inch piece part of the piece they were measuring was a sinusoidal wave. And so the, the problem was clear. The part in the loose cullet at the slow speed was actually moving. It was oscillating. That caused an uneven cutting pattern uh, rather than just a rough surface. It was actually the, the cutting pattern that was causing the problem. So they went back and 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 talked about it and said, well, you know what, we we never run it with a loose color. We always snug it up really good. Uh, we did it for the DOE, but I'm not sure why they did it, because uh, they'd never use that. So what we decided to do is take the data we had and just ignore half of it, the loose color data, and reanalyze it as a replicated two to the third. Okay, so this half of the data over on the left here with the, the greater spread, and you can see the three highlighted outliers, but there's also a much greater spread with some of the other points was ignored, and the data on the right with the tight cullet was then analyzed. We did that, it looks a, a little more reasonable in that we get a model with, with one factor, B, which is the feed. Uh, that model is highly significant. And uh, lack of fit's also significant, but if you if you look at the adjusted and predicted R squared, you know they're explaining almost all of the variations. So I'm not too concerned about the lack of fit, and the adequate precision at 54.4 is really high. So this this model's um, fine to use, and so what you can see is that. Uh, that one factor, which is the, the feed, um, 
it only affects it when you use a tight cullet and a simple solution and you can see here that you don't want to use too high of a speed rate that's what's causing the rough finish using a low lower feed rate is 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 much better and so we've got a very simple solution I mean using this model with just factor B rather than trying to use that model with a B and C and all the interactions and they're really trying to explain that sinusoidal wave caused by the loose cullet in combination with with the other factors um, not sure you would have gotten the right answer uh, so here by not paying uh, by paying attention to the residual plots and using our subject matter knowledge we got a very simple and good solution out of this so that's one case study and that had too many things significant so here's a, a kind of an alternate case study where nothing was significant so what do you do when you run a design and nothing turns out to be significant well that's the trick we're going to talk about so uh, thank you to Dave DeVoe for letting us use this this example and uh, at Dave's company, they were making uh, aluminum castings for uh, hard drives, and they were having an awful lot of defects, uh, castings that they couldn't use, and so they were studying factors associated with that casting process, which was hot oil temperature, trip in millimeters, molten aluminum temperature, um, whether they used the fast shot velocity, how fast it was and the dwell time and their response was they'd make a hundred parts they would, would inspect them and the fraction defective uh, so that would be a number between zero none of them were defective to one a hundred out of a hundred were defective uh, was their response and they were having a, a high defect rate and running this design to his dismay none of the factors seemed to make any difference Okay, so first thing we looked at the data, and sometimes when you say none of the factors make any difference, it's because all of the response values are the same or very similar, and then that tells you, well, yeah, you must have studied the wrong things or the wrong levels, because the response didn't change. Well, in this case, you can see the response did change a lot. It went from, let's see, some low values of 0 0.14, 0 0.14, 0 0.12 to some high values of 0 0.98, 1, everything defective, you know, almost everything defective, 0 0.9. So there's lots of variation. So it's, it's not because nothing was happening. Okay, so we went back and looked at it and said, well, here's the half normal plot for the effects. And you can see nothing's falling to the right of the line. These points that are that are uh, on the right and above the line, they're actually a little smaller than what you'd expect given the amount of variation that's present. So nothing was significant. So what do we do now? Well, what we did was we said, well, we're going to select something anyhow. So there's lots of variation in the response, but no effects. So here's the procedure we followed to, to find out if there's possibly a problem with the, any of the runs. We picked a couple of the most extreme effects on the half normal plot. So if we got to pick something, might as well pick the biggest ones. Then we looked for a potential outlier, judged the influence of that outlier. Uh, if it's influential, then you investigate it. You go back and try to find out if there was a problem. And if you can find a problem with it, then you can either correct it if you know the problem was it wasn't court recorded correctly or if there was a bigger problem that it wasn't run correctly you could ignore it okay so we just selected d and bd then we said make the model uh, uh, hierarchical and it picked factor b so we ended up with this model with three factors once we looked at the residuals it was pretty clear there was a point that was different than the rest given the model that we picked now we don't know if that model's right or not, but given that model, there's certainly a point that's different. You can see it also on the residuals versus predicted and on the, the run chart of the runs. Then we say, well, was it really influential? Well, if you look at Cook's distance, it's pretty influential. And we said, well, did it change the fitted value for that run? So DF fits is a 
difference between the predicted value using all the runs and then subtracting off the predicted value when that runs eliminated and you can see yes it is pretty influential it changes the results significantly okay so we went back and investigated that suspected outlier and um, the operator confirmed there are problems with run number nine uh, if I remember correctly what happened is it took longer than expected to 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 run the DOE and so the last run was done on the next shift and they said make this run and the operators looked at it and said that's crazy this isn't going to work so they adjusted some of the factor levels and uh, did something that was completely outside the the scope of the design and so we had a good reason to ignore that result and of course now once you ignore that result then we're going to get that that model that we selected before is, is probably going to come up because that's what caused us to ignore it and so that's why you have to be careful to investigate. Otherwise, if you just go in, arbitrarily fit a model, and delete all the data that doesn't agree with that model, then the remaining data will agree with it. It doesn't mean you've got the right model. In this case, we found a good reason to eliminate that value before we did. And so we could eliminate it. Once we eliminate it, then we could clearly see, I remember that model was BD and the BD interaction. So looking at the, the BD interaction, this, this line's kind of curved because we were using the arc sine square root transformation for the um, binomial nature of the data with the fraction defective as a response. And um, that's the right thing to do. So you can see that, that three out of four of these are, are within variation probably the same, but this fast shot, uh, with the 390 trip is the one that's causing the problem. And so eliminating that greatly, greatly reduced the, the number of defects. Um, then they went on, did some further experimentation, which I'm not going to talk about, and improved it even further. But this, this explained, gave them an explanation for why they periodically would have really bad high defect rates. Okay, so here's some, some references if you want to um, dig into this any further. Um, here's a slide that shows a, a, a mock-up of our, our website when you go to our training website and shows the, the classes if you're interested in more training. Uh, experimental design made easy and response surface methods. We've combined those into a three-day class called Modern DOE for Process Optimization. Uh, we also have a class on mixture and mixtures combined with, with process factors. Um, we have a class on, on robust designs so that would be pretty much focused on using that POE to try and make your products uh, have less variability or be more robust. Um, we have a number of classes that are uh, industry specific. We have uh, classes for pharma, life science, assay optimization, and food science. We also have some more classes that are online. You can find those on Stadies Academy. Um, and over here is also on Stadies Academy, a class on factorial split plot design. So if you want to go to our website, look at those. If you have any questions, contact uh, Sherry. Uh, she's our workshop manager. Otherwise, I, I appreciate you uh, attending my webinar. I hope you got something useful out of it. Uh, the slides from this are, are posted on the website. And... Within a couple days, there'll also be a recording of the, the webinar posted on, on the website. And again, if during the, the webinar you had questions, be sure to send those to me and I'll, I'll get back to you. Uh, I'll try to answer them if I can. And thank you for joining me today.